Hello. My face is back again this week and today we are going to be talking about a subject I'm very excited to talk about and we're going to be talking about the fan fiction Manacled. So, how did this all begin? I think we've all seen the absolute surge of uh, Harry Potter content that has been going on on TikTok. Uh, yes, I'm here for it. I was never uh, growing up. I was never like a Harry Potter super fan. I've seen all the films. I've I actually try. I I think I started reading the books, but never really got around to reading the books. To be honest, I just have them. But I wasn't that big of a Harry Potter fan. So when this when Hogwarts Legacy the game was announced, and people were getting really hyped about it, I didn't care that much like it's cool i like the universe but i didn't care that much i also was a bit confused still am we'll probably play this game now but the the hogwarts legacy game rebirthed the tiktok harry potter community and with the tiktok harry potter community came the manacled community so what happened was I was scrolling through TikTok, you know, listening to the Slytherin parties, agreeing with everyone that only, <laughs> only the um, Gryffindors will not be invited. I have actually started um, enjoying more all the other houses. And then I stumbled upon Manacled and someone was talking very passionately about it. And I was like, okay okay and I scroll down like not even two videos later someone else talking about manacled and I was like okay let me see what this is about uh and I had I literally just discovered AO3 just discovered it so I was I was already into the mood of reading a fan fiction so I was like Draco Malfoy with Hermione Granger in a post world that law kind of was losing the war and he's um and like they lost the war i was like oh oh this could be really interesting Ooh. someone had made a tiktok which was probably the best possible pitch for this book i need to see if i save the tiktok but in any case you'll probably see it if you search manacled on tiktok and it was um Manacled is a is a Handmaid's Tale inspired book of uh, Hermione being put into these kind of breeding programs and she has memories that are locked away and Voldemort wants to find them so the whole book is about her lost memory and she's given to Draco Malfoy and I was like Ooh, okay let's see what this is about <laughs> so I will say two this two very important things Number one, if you're interested in this, go read it. Seriously, go read it. I think it's worth the read. Number two, I do have a lot of criticism to say about this book. I do not think it's perfect in any way. However, I want this criticism to be completely separate from the author. I do not... I see that the author is a real person. You can interact with this author. This is not... Someone who had a writing team, who had a publishing team, who had an editor. This is someone who sat in their room and wrote actually a freaking good story. And I have a lot of respect for that. I think what they did with this was very impressive. So despite all the criticism that I have for this book, I want to acknowledge that this is actually really good. This is a great read. If you already like the universe, you will probably absolutely love this. And especially if you, <laughs> like me, <laughs> when you were younger, actually liked Draco Malfoy, you will probably enjoy this book. So, that's it. From here on out, full spoilers, let's get into the book. So, the book starts with um, Hermione having being locked away in a torture chamber, which is actually a real torture method where... They, it's complete sensory deprivation, so she can't hear, she can't uh, see anything. She's in a dark room, they're keeping her there. She's kind of... All she remembers is that everyone is dead. Everyone is dead, including Harry, Ron, Je Jeannie, everyone is dead. Every important character from the original 
Harry Potter is dead. Uh, and she's alone. And she's brought in front of Voldemort, who, uh, after losing the war, was very weakened, because despite the fact that the Order lost, he's very weakened. Again, I I'm speaking as if I'm assuming you've read the book. Like, I'm not gonna do a full summary of the book, it's also so long, so... I'm reading, I'm just speaking as if, like, you've read the book. So, she's brought in front of the Voldemort and uh, she's put into Draco's care and she's terrified of that. The thing is, and, and this continues for about 30%, where I read it online, which seems to be the first place that the original author published it. Wait, let me just open. So, I read it on a site called webnovel.com. So, that's where I read it. And on webnovel.com, you have a percentage of how far along you've gone in the story. So, that's where I read it. And I'm speaking in terms of percentages from this particular site. If you read it on AO3, I saw it's on also there. Then I can't really say, but anyways, it's it's about the chapter. So the first so the first 25 chapters are before she remembers what happened. And it builds this character of Malfoy that um he's absolutely evil and everything that happens around her being put into this disgusting breeding program her being put into his home at Malfoy Estate, and how terrified she is of that. She has panic attacks. It's all very descriptive. And, and in here in the book, for me, two very important things happen that later I will say why they were really poorly done. Number one, she is established very, very clearly as an unreliable narrator. This book is written in third-person perspective as in she, 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 as if... It's an omnipotent narrator. That's usually what they are. A third-person narration implies that this is an omnipotent, bleh, omnipotent narrator that is telling you about the story. However, every single description is written as if it was in first person, which establishes that this is an unreliable narrator. And you start to understand that the ways in which she rationalizes Draco Malfoy's and other characters, but specifically his actions around what they are doing, are unreliable. For example, the first time that, um, not the first time, but when, oh, what's her name? Umbridge, that pink, annoying teacher lady, is killed, and it turns out that she also had one of the Horcruxes on her chest. You understand that the reason that she's killed was because. Draco was actually getting revenge for the way that Hermione was treated. I don't... The, the, the inherent problem with a book like this is that you know that it's fan fiction. So the original first 30% of the book, you are entirely aware that where it's gonna go, which is that they were lovers. You, you know, you know that the, where this is going is that they were lovers. And there's something that happened that they got here. But you know that they were lovers. There is no secret. There is no spoiling. It's just, you know. And, and actually, I will give it credit. I think it's decently written. Not decently. It's very well written. In establishing exactly how those rationalizations like, oh, there must really be a last member of the Order that killed her. And it's not Draco. Even though you as the reader know that it's Draco. Like, you know it's him. You know that he killed her specifically. And it was, like, actually really smart how he managed to also fit the Horcrux into that entire ordeal. Like, you understand the things he is doing from uh, taking her outside and walking with her, giving her shoes. Like, you see how she rationalizes every single action that is normally perceivably kind as a form of him satisfying his own, you know, evil ways. He is evil and therefore there is no redeemable quality. And, and I think it works well in the sense that she truly believes it, so it's understandable that she would want to rationalize everything in order to protect herself. But you as the reader 
establish a relationship with the way that the story is told, that this is an unreliable narrator, that this does not give you the full image of what you're reading. This does not allow you a perspective outside. So you start gradually guessing what that perspective is going to be. And I think that the logistics, like the way that the story is told and structured, like the events, what comes after what, are fantastic. However, <laughs> this book is so long. It is, oh my God, it's so long. It took me, and I'm not like the fastest reader, but some something like this, like a Gahul book, this is about, what, a little less than 200 pages. Not the smallest thing. This takes me about a day, right? Howl's Moving Castle. This, this takes me about two days. This fan fiction took me, <laughs> it took me a week. It took me a week. I started reading it on Monday, today is Saturday. I just finished the epilogue. This took me an entire week. You do not underestimate how long this book is. And, and I think that a huge portion of all this writing could have been removed. What do I mean? <laughs> there are so many times where a certain point is repeated over and over again, over and over again, something we already know, something as the audience that we understand. It, it, at times, events are retold and retold or details like, oh, uh, the Order doesn't trust Snape in these extremely long paragraphs. And I'm like, I know, <laughs> you could say it in one sentence. Like, it, it sometimes even interrupts the flow because you would be in the middle of an action sequence, like something is happening, a dialogue is going on, and, in, and the dialogue is interrupted with a long paragraph of description of something else. And I'm like, I don't need to know. <laughs> I don't care. Um... In the first 30%, the most that kind of bothered me was the overbearing descriptions of what she was thinking while she was on the table. Like, the, the detailed description of the potions that she would make. And I'm like, the first time you read it, fine, cool, this, is, this gets you into her headspace. But then on like the couple next times, I'm like, scooting over, like, I don't care. And, and it's really difficult for me to pinpoint exactly where it is unless I have to go back and go through the book and again the first 30 percent were monday and tuesday and we're saturday today so <laughs> I, they're not as fresh as the latter part of the book but in any case I, I even then i was like oh my god this is slow this is uh this is slow and i always thought because of this establishment that this is almost first person narration and this is completely unreliable information as a as a perspective, you know, as a judgment on actions. I was entirely expecting this book to switch perspective onto Draco halfway through. This is what I thought would happen. We will have 50% of the book entirely through her perspective and 50% through his perspective. So around 30% in the book, we start the first flashback and then the next 50% of the books yeah, from chapter 26 to chapter 64. So that's 50% of the book. That's the literally half of the book, but it's just in the middle. Is the real story. What actually happened between Draco and Hermione. And before that, you get little snippets of, of episodes that later are actually explored into those 50%. I think it was really cool how they were integrated. And as you read through, it kind of builds. You start off, so Draco approached the Order and he asked for Hermione to be his... I don't know how to put it. Like, the way that the book kind of says, like, her, her his... But that's not what it is. It's basically insurance. I would call it an insurance policy. The thing is, um, when I first started reading the flashbacks, I was entirely convinced that Draco had requested Hermione because he did actually, like, he was already in love with her. This, to me, was so important because 
as I was reading the book, the unreliable kind of self monologuing nature of how it's written continues throughout the entire thing. So I was reading along, it was going really, it's really interesting. Seriously, read it. It's really interesting. Like he starts training her. The Even at first, like the little, f the, the way that he was a bit forceful and then he was like, okay, this is not, <laughs> I'm not going to be forceful. And he starts training her and their whole thing. And then the runes and that she heals him. I don't know, these scenes, because now I'm, post what I'm about to talk but when I was reading it these scenes were so powerful to me because I didn't read those scenes as their first bonding together I read those scenes as this is a man who was ready to die he had an unrequited love that he had accepted that will never be returned and now she is the one healing him and doing everything she can to keep him alive. And he eventually eases up to allowing her to do it. I don't, I did not read it as this is their first moment of acknowledging each other as people. I did not read it that way. <laughs> I read it as this is a huge step for him in oh my god, I am being seen as a human being by the person I love, right? So when they have that scene on the couch, which is an amazing scene, and they start, and they finally start kissing, and the moment that she hesitates, he just pushes her off, and he, he has that vulnerable moment. To me, that was like, it must be so heartbreaking to be on the cusp of having who you want to be with and yet still feeling like they're unavailable. Like, that's how I was reading that scene. That's how I was reading his desire to protect her. Then when she gets bitten by the vampire in the forest and she goes to the shack... And she's bleeding on the floor violently and he just arrives and he, he's just looking at her and he doesn't know what to do. I read that as n he fully understands that he is not capable of helping her. And it comes out of absolute respect for the fact that she is so much better at being a healer. Not better, that she is a healer and she will manage to save herself. That the only Thing that is so painful that he can do is just stand there and watch as the person he is in love with is saving herself because he can't do anything. <laughs> right? About like 55, 57% of the book, I think it was around the scene with Severus, I started realizing that the internal monologuing, and it is the razor, this is internal monologuing, and if you argue with me, I don't know, maybe you don't read it that way, but to me, this whole like, oh, he was a tool, blah, 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 and then like reminding yourself, and he, he does this because uh, uh, rationalization one, and rationalization two, and, it, um, and I need to win, I need to win, I have a mission, I need to bound him, like bind him to me, I need him value me right like all this to me was internal monologuing and i started realizing when we crossed the halfway mark because i was fully expecting that when we hit 50 percent or around there that we will switch perspectives and we will go to his the entire time i was like oh my god i'm so interested to to see how he saw that i'm so interested i really want to know how did he, what did he think when that happened? What did he think when that happened? And around 50 something percent of the book, I was like, okay, I don't think we're going to switch perspective. And around 57, I was like, I have a really bad feeling that you're supposed to take all of these narrations at face value. I think that you were supposed to take these narrations at face value. And at 60% of the book, is where I almost stopped reading. 
So at 60% of the book, if you you it's the scene the first time when they they have the moment, right? It's the first time when she gives in and she kisses him after they were dueling, and she kisses him, and they melt together and they do the deeds, and he breaks down uh and confesses the truth. And the truth, the truth was exactly at face value. The truth of this, I'm still so mad. I'm so mad at the way that this is written. So he didn't care about her. He actually randomly chose her. It was all for his mom, which, which don't get me wrong. The mom is a great point, but it changes the way that you're supposed to read the entirety of what happened. And I did not read it. I read it with the assumption that he was already in love with her. And when you were supposed to switch that, it, 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 to me, it felt a betrayal of, of the entire book. I was like, this betrays the entire book. It just... I, I was so mad. I almost stopped reading. So... He didn't care about her at all. She was just a secondhand thought because, oh, uh, which is a great line. It's a great line. And was something along the lines of apparently there's an expiration date on grief because Snape and uh, Kingsley and the, what's his name? The guy that first introduces the cruciatus spell, whatever, the one-eyed guy, they wouldn't believe him if he said it was just for his mom. Very, very poignant message very poignant message very interesting message the way that it, the 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 writing is great the idea but i just hate that i was supposed to read everything before that at face value i was supposed to read it as oh he 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 was just doing it for the shits and giggles he trained her for the shits of it he he started caring about her because they were building a connection then that's when it started and i was it just <sighs> it felt so absurd to me i was like i i started thinking maybe if originally the book started with the flashbacks it would have been more believable but by the time you get to the flashbacks, you know that he's in love with her and she is an unreliable narrator. You get to the flashbacks and there is nothing to indicate otherwise. <laughs> there is nothing to indicate that this isn't an unreliable narrator anymore. Which I, will, I still think she's a completely unreliable narrator and it's proven again and again that she is. But the problem is that you're supposed to take whatever she narrates at face value. You're supposed to take it at face value. Because if you take it at face value, you're reading it how it's supposed to be. <laughs> and I was not reading it that way. I was reading it as this: she is a person that hates herself so much. She is so insecure. She is so alone. She is so abandoned to the point of needing to rationalize everything from everyone to defend herself. And the fact that that wasn't the only truth. It was also, yeah, he did not care. And uh, he started caring for her because she healed him. <laughs> and the entire book became a Twilight novel. It was, I love how there's, uh, if you don't know Kenny JD, go watch her. She puts it the best way. It's just like the magical pussy is coming. And we get into the most problematic trope in all of romantic writing and that is the magical pussy it is the reinforced belief in girls and women through media that if you love him enough if you care enough if you heal if you do something it can fix him and it's bullshit. I do not believe in this narrative. I do not believe in that. So this is where, to me, the book 
came around and became a fan fiction again. Because I kid you not, I came for the fan fiction and I stayed for the plot because the plot is really good. So what I did in my mind to get over this, because I don't agree with it, is the following. Everything is uh, pretty much the same. Draco loses his mom. His mom was tortured by Voldemort. It was a horrific experience. He kills Dumbledore for to save her. It's atrocious. And eventually she dies. In the reports, he finds about he finds information about Hermione. And since the dark side does not know that Harry is in love with Ginny. He starts tracking whatever that he can find about Hermione at first as a means to find a weakness to Harry because he has a he believes that Harry might be with Hermione. And gradually that turns into an obsession over her. And it's a callback to one of the lines in the earlier, like before the flashbacks, where he was saying, like, you were never an appreciated healer. You did. You sacrificed everything to be a healer, and yet no one appreciated that. And that, to me, was such a poignant point. And and I think that's what I would use is that his obsession with her began after his mother died, and it it was like it, again. It can be dark and twisted. It it doesn't need to be like oh healthy. Oh my god, I'm so in love with her. But it's it's an obsession. And when he approached the order, it was truly a mistake. Like Snape said, it was a mistake that he called her by name. He was just... He couldn't avoid calling her by name. And he had an obsession with her. You know, you can call it love, you can call it something else. But he already had something towards her. It wasn't like... I didn't care. You were just another muggle witch. And I knew you were sitting behind and not on the battlefield so you wouldn't die and I wouldn't have to change whores every three months. And it was like, that's bullshit. (laughs) This is absolute fucking bullshit. Like, no. I refuse. So, that scene to me would run in a very similar fashion except instead of him saying i can't i can't i can't i can't care about anyone ever again he is rather saying you're not real you're not real you are not real right like like that moment of he finally admits to himself that his obsession isn't it, it, it's it's real like it's not just an obsession anymore it's it's real and and this is real and holy fuck and like she might actually care for him and uh, and he might have some of that humanity in him left. And the scene would play out very similarly, except the whole initial, I didn't care about you, you were just a blah, blah, blah. Like, skip that paragraph, add the mom, add the very, very poignant line about, like, there's an expiration date on grief. And then end it with, uh, you're not real, you're not real. Uh, Also, the whole internal monologuing of Hermione during that scene that was like, I won. I own him. I did that. And I'm like, no, I am against that. Like, as an internal monologuing, it's fine. I think it's fine as an internal monologuing. But at that point, I realized that you're supposed to take these at face value. No, she did not win. There was, again, it it feeds into this very unhealthy belief that we as women have is that like the magical pussy is going to make him love you. No, no, there is no, nothing you forcefully can do to make someone care for you. She didn't trick him. It wasn't like, oh, my grand scheme, I'm going to be the whore that gets him. It's like, no, no, I think... I think it devalues him as a character, which which in general, now that we're here at the 60% mark, let me talk about all the other problems I have with the book. I've already mentioned that the book is uh, mm, descriptive to a fault, and sometimes I wish we would skip certain descriptions or skip repetitions. Again, off the top of my head, the fucking, the order hates Snape. We get it. I don't need to hear it in tef- different paragraphs. I know. Um... But another point I have 
especially in the earlier parts of the book. I think it gets a lot better later on. The earlier parts of the book, the only, read it again, because I got so mad at one point as I was reading, the only descriptive word about the way that Draco speaks are two, smirk and sneer. <laughs> Which is the most indicative thing of fan fiction ever. No, I don't think that the man who is doing what he's supposed to do entirely forcefully, and, and I don't even mean it by, in retrospect, what I know about the situation. I mean it in the situation. His descriptions are very good. Like, the description, he is so cold. He is... His presence is menacing. He reeks of dark magic. He, the moment he appears in a space, it's like a dark hole in that space. Ice cold, completely dehumanized. Almost like a... Ro I see him almost like a doll. Like a beautiful, dangerous doll. There is no way that that description, that visual description that is so poignant is the same character who smirks at every line. He would not smirk at every line. Every other description is a smirk, a, a, a some type of laugh. I'm like, no, literally, no. He would not smirk. I think it also takes away from a potential thing that you could do later on, like have the first smile be something important, right? Like, like why is he smirking all the time? Like. When we when we jump back to the flashback before everything happens, he's a bit younger, you know, a bit brattier. I understand. I think it would work. Not as much as he smirks, but still, I can see a kind of boyishness that would be in his earlier versions from the way that he carries himself to the way that he speaks. But because of these, like... <laughs> nonsensical amount of smirks... Um, I don't think they work. And a lot of the descriptions of the actions are... Mm. Another thing. Uh, I think the voice of each character gets lost throughout the book. So what I mean by voice. When we talk about, like... I'm mostly about... I know more about script writing, but I'm sure in a book it's the same. Every character has a personality which leads to them having a specific voice. So when you're reading a line of dialogue that is supposed to be said by them, it should be so in tune with them as a character that you hear a specific voice and it consistently repeats that voice throughout the entirety of the work that you're reading, right? The problem with this book, I don't know when, how, or why exactly it happens, but throughout the book, I continuously kept losing the voice. There wasn't a consistent voice for each character that was unique to them. Which, to me, took away from the experience. <laughs> like, again, I think, I think as I was reading this book... The, the the story is so gripping the entire time I was like, oh, how I wish this had an editor. I just, you can tell, you can tell that this is written by a single person who is so into the story that they can't look out to see it from the side. And I think that the entire, the entire time I was like, I wish this had an editor. I wish this just had someone, you know, because these things are, are so minute, but when they add up, they just... <sighs> Show the cracks of the this is just a fan fiction. They they just glean <laughs> through the surface and crack around it and make something that was so good kind of break at the seams, unfortunately. So around those 60%, I had canoned it for myself. I fan fictioned myself into Rewriting it as uh, not necessarily he was like already formally in love with her, but at least he had an absolute obsession with her and he wanted to be near her, even if subconsciously. And when he breaks down, he it, it's more like, you're not real. Like literally in his head, like he finally collides that shit, this is becoming real. Then, um... Then <laughs> we get into the actual fan fiction. The rest, like from then on, for a while, at least until 
probably until the end of the flashbacks, almost like there is interesting story beats. But towards the, after that, we get into the fan fiction. There is a lot of madooing, there is a lot of kissing, there is a lot of um, descriptive uh, things and a lot of uh, romantic sentences. And it's great. It is genuinely great. I think the, the other title for this book should be called Manacled. Um, AKA <laughs> consent is the hottest thing on earth because oh my gosh, the way the way that it's written is so good. <laughs> like oh, like some of the scenes I was like, can I? Can I? I think at some point there was like a mention that was like, yeah, Lucius was like, that's later after the flashbacks. We'll get there. But at some point I was like, take me, take me. I want to be in her place. Which which is what a fan fiction is supposed to do, right? Like, it's a fan fiction. Um, the problem was, as I said, I came for the fan fiction and I stayed for the plot. So by the time we got to the fan fiction, which again, this is such a long book, it took a very long time to get there. But by the time we got to like, oh, he was so rich and he has multiple penthouses in hotels around the world and he would teleport her to a different penthouse every night and they would sleep in a big king-size bed. And I was like, right, we, we completely devolved into <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. Like, oh yes, the powerful rich man who takes you on an escapade. Like, what is this fucking, what was it called? 360, never even watched that movie, but yeah. Like, that's where the fan fiction is. It's it's pretty much in between 60 and 70% of the book. That's where all, if you want just the fan fiction, Read 60 to 70 percent of the book. It's it's great. Um, but I just I was like, can we get back to the story? Like, get back to the story. Like, okay, okay, I get it. I get it. They love each other. Okay, I get it. They love each other. It's fantastic. It's amazing. The descriptions are great, but fuck, get me back to the story because this is so long. So then, uh, in a very rushed uh, turn of events, uh, which again, I understand why it's rushed. It's so focused around the, the romance between Draco and Hermione that it doesn't really give any other characters room to exist, breathe, or kind of formulate in this universe. Which, I don't know. Eh, I don't know. I don't know if it's good or bad because I do like the focus around the, the main couple. And this is a fan fiction, that's what you came for. But on the other hand, the story is so good, I'm like, I wish, I wish it wasn't, I wish it wasn't monologuing. I really wish this was written with a proper omnipotent narrator and we could see everything that's going around. Genuinely. It would take you out of the panic attacks. I think the panic attack descriptions are fantastic, but it would, it would give a much broader perspective of what is going on. Anyways. We get to the f one of the final acts. Ginny's pregnant. Um, Hermione does not... Like, Hermione protects her from Harry because uh, he doesn't... He doesn't know. Uh, and in the end, uh, Harry dies. Uh, and uh, Hermione actually... It was, it was very well written. So Draco saves her. And she's like, we can't leave Genie behind. And Draco saves Genie in an ultimate act of self-destruction, which is a tendency he has, which is fine. Uh, and he's like, he uh, he exposes himself as a traitor to save Genie. And he's like, fine, you promise now you will leave and I will die. And of course, Hermione's like, fuck that shit. Uh, and she goes and does her badassery and uh, destroys the lab, pretends that she's the one that saves Jeannie, uh, but unfortunately gets captured despite her trying to escape. And uh, she has a new Patronus, which is a huge dragon, which is so cool. And the dragon is like this representation of her love for Draco and how he inspired that Patronus, and it's, it's so cool. And then we kind of finish with the flashback. So she's captured... And Draco's name is cleared because <clears throat> it seems like she's the one that destroyed the entire lab and he wasn't involved. And then we get back to today, right? And I was so curious, you know, it's like around 60, even, even before 60%, but especially after the 60%, I was like, oh my God, okay, 
which is chapter 49. 40, 49 is when that happens. And chapter 75 is when we get back to the modern... Okay. And, and chapter 75 is when we get back to, like, the current day, which is uh, in the Malfoy house and the... What is it called? The... The breeding, the, the bad stuff, right? Like, I was so interested. I was imagining that scene in so many different ways. And I think it was written perfectly fine. She has another panic attack. He's, he's like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Again, very well. I think it was well written. I think it was well written, except... I th okay, the initial the initial scenes are great. I think it was really well written in the way that he is not going near her. He is like, okay, well, I am glad we are over that, and I will never be forgiven, which he will never be forgiven. And um, it was really well written, huh? and it gave me like a moment of like, huh? I'm kind of glad that she didn't immediately forgive him. She never forgives him, which is great. She didn't immediately go like, oh, I understand. Um, however, the fact that she didn't figure out why he had to be so cruel to me was a bit out of character. I was like, like, I feel like that was more of she didn't figure out why he had to do it, which is because Voldemort could see her memory. So if he was kind, Voldemort would have known. Um... But I'm like, I'm pretty sure she would have figured it out. Um, but anyways. So we get back to the current state. He is terrified of the kid. Uh, understandably so. She isn't. She continues to have panic attacks, which... <sighs> I'm gonna speak a, 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 towards, like, speaking of... Uh, having read the entire thing. We're, we're not just the, that moment when she initially remembers. Towards the end of the book as well. All the way to the end of the book. Her never getting over the anxiety and panic attacks to me left her where she started. For me, after the remembrance, it was really interesting. It was really interesting. Don't get me wrong. The Lucius thing... The way that she understood that, you know, Draco was tortured because Lucius was failing to find the the last member of the order that they still believed was there, and then Lucius and Narcissa. Oh, Narcissa! The the portrait thing where Narcissa, being a sixteen year old portrait, was more concerned with her husband Lucius who in her mind was almost like her boyfriend rather than her son was such a great detail to me like this book has such genius details and this is one of them like that was so smart i was like oh my god that oh i see how that works that is so smart um and and the fact that we do see eventually that lucius absolutely loves his son and he really wants to save him and he's doing you know he's insane and he's gone crazy and psychotic and he's lost his mind but he does love his son which which is very in line with the original harry potter timeline because in the original harry potter timeline the malfoys are a very close-knit family the malfoys are a very tight family and eventually they leave the dark side to survive they're just like, the Malfoys are far more concerned with each other than anyone else. So uh, I think that was a great detail towards that resolution, towards the end, literally towards the end. Um, yeah, I think it was, yeah, that one was great. Like, she got the tears, it was this heirloom. Uh, she saves Draco, she cuts off his arm, they escape to Denmark, they escape. I think that was great. Throughout the book, however, you do, you never shake off this kind of, I think, yeah, I think we're kind of done with the overview of the narrative. I think the narrative was great. So throughout the book, you, you, Hermione is a badass in many regards. I think one thing that this book does amazingly well is completely raise awareness of the healers during war. 
it, it genuinely at certain times during the book, I, re I remembered stories of uh, during the Second World War, how Japan had the schoolgirls from the age of 14 sitting and healing soldiers who were sent to the front lines. And, and there are these amazing documentaries that show how horrific the experience of being in the medical ward during war was. And the fact that to this day, this is seen as a much easier job. It is seen as a lesser job. And, I, and it remind, like it actually gave me like um, a perspective on how Sakura in Naruto is seen as a useless character. But if you actually look at what she does, it's very similar to Hermione. She's a healer and she sees all the horrors in the medical ward and she is saving people. She's healing poisons. She is... I think that what this book does incredibly well is give awareness, to give the deserved fucking credit to how strong-willed and strong-minded you need to be to work this job and that it's essential and it's underappreciated and that she had to be who she was. Hermione had to be who she was because no one else was willing to learn healing because they didn't think it was that like it was such an in, this is such a powerful potent way to present a critique on our society despite the fact that this is a magical world and i think it's great i think it was fantastic and in that regard i think she's metal and and a badass the problem is that she is still <laughs> treated as a damsel in distress no it's not a, really a problem i think they're you know the the it's well, it's well written, it's well justified, but at some point, especially towards the end of the book, where we're getting further and further into the resolution, and especially in the epilogues, I was like, get over the whole panic attacks every five seconds and him being the only thing that allows her to stand. Like, allow her to grow. Allow her to grow. Because throughout the book... And, and it's really interesting. I'm drawing so many parallels. I think that this book has a very similar problem to uh, the Korean film of interpreting uh, Snow White and the Seven Drawers. Because in this book, despite the fact that Hermione is supposed to be the protagonist, she's not. The protagonist is Draco. Because Draco is the character who has growth. Draco is the character... And, and if you read it at face value, if you don't read it with my head canon that he was already obsessed with her, if you read it at face value, Draco goes from a man resigned to death in a final act of vengeance, learning to love someone else, learning to trust someone else, then that trust betraying him again and him learning to trust again to the point that he decides to live, to the point that he allows himself to live. And they escape. The, the character growth that Draco Malfoy goes through in this book is absolutely fascinating. And it's so interesting. And I love it. The character growth that Hermione goes through, however, completely. Almost, almost not existent. She starts off as a underappreciated healer who is self-isolating because of all of her internal monologuing. We clearly see that her friends still love her, even if they disagree. That's all the internal monologuing and self-hate gets her to self-isolate. Um, and she uh, she believes that she's controlling him by fulfilling her role as the, the Order's whore. She doesn't grow to be like, no, I am my own person and people don't just sell me. And I am genuinely developing feelings. Like she always rationalizes it in some way, and she continues to do this. And and like eventually she's just like, yeah, I love him. And that's the <laughs> and that's where she's left. She is left at I love him. And she becomes this kind of like anchor. Like, you will love this child. You will love this child, and you will live. I will make you live. And I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> like, I don't think that any of her um any of her self-doubt, self-worry, self-hatred goes away. There is no real growth for this character. Um, and to bring back the analogy to the Korean film of Snow White, in Korean film of Snow White, Snow White is even in all the marketing and everything, but the character that goes through growth is Merlin. Merlin who learns to um, not value external beauty in himself. It's not even about her. Like He allows her to see him ugly and... 
grows as a person and eventually they come together after he has worked on himself. So it's in a very similar sense, like the female protagonist is just a facade for the journey that the male character is actually going through. And um, in that sense, I think, in that sense, I don't, I don't think they grow enough. <laughs> like, I don't think she grows enough as a character. I think she, they definitely should have eased up on the internal monologue <laughs> towards the end. Um, and kind of, you know, I don't know, eased around that whole thing. She's still a badass though. Like she cuts off his arm and and heals it. Like she's an, she's essentially it's pretty much acknowledged that if she wasn't in the middle of a war trying to hide for war crimes, she would literally be a Nobel Prize winner for her discoveries. She's an absolute badass. But a lot of that is overshadowed by her constantly somehow not being able to breathe, cries, and being a damsel in distress who's constantly safe. Like. I don't know. I think it's a 50-50. This is a, a fan fiction you have to, like, <laughs> also, you know, self-insert and be like, oh, Draco Malfoy wants to save me, you know, all that. Um, but I think this book is so good that it just it just needs to take a leap of faith and separate itself from a fan fiction. I think this book is, can be great. Draco Malfoy. I have a problem with Draco Malfoy's character in that he is perfect and pristine in every conceivable way outside of his descriptions of being a merciless killer. Draco Malfoy is perfectly emotionally intelligent. He starts telling her, despite the fact that he is so isolated, he starts telling her, you do not need to make your death convenient for others. You can trust people. You are allowed to trust people. This is dialogue that he tells her despite the fact that I don't see how his character would be able to proficiently verbalize that well. I understand that his character can have that intent in what he's wanting to tell her. But for him to so proficiently verbalize that exact feeling he has about it is impossible. And this is where we come back to the voice of the characters isn't clear. I don't see how him, as the character he is, the, self, the self-hatred, isolation, the, the way that he sees himself as a monster, and the fact that in the place that he lives in... Oh, sorry, my hair. It's so hot. I cannot... <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Okay. I. It's so hot. I'm sorry. You will deal with my hair. So, where he lives which is the Dark Order, he can barely speak. Speak Like, from what I see, he is barely allowed to speak from what we understand. Barely. He is He's covered with a mask. People couldn't even tell it was him for, like, years. He, they didn't even know that he was the High Reeve. That's how little he exposed them of himself as a personality. For him to have the emotional maturity, self-reflectance, intelligence, and verbal aptitude to properly talk to someone who also hates themselves, I don't think I don't think that he would be capable of that in the in the book where he does it, which is like around the time like, right after he realizes he he loves her. Like, right after the breakdown scene. I just... I don't see it. <laughs> I don't see that happening. This is just a fantasy. This is where, like, the male, the male lead is just a fantasy. It's like... We want that, right? Like, we want the man to be emotionally... He, it's, it, it's this kind of toxic view of, like... I want a man who I can heal. I can be the magical pussy that saves him. But he also needs to be emotionally intelligent enough to comfort me. That's not how it works. <laughs> Second, uh, he's hot, you know, muscled, chiseled, beautiful, big shoulders, you know, but not not too muscly, you know, not too muscly. Then, then it's said that he becomes skinny, which I'm like, <laughs> whatever. I don't care. Like, I don't see it happening, but whatever. Chisel. That, that is, to me, the physical appearance of him being hot is very believable. You know, he is also a noble lord from a family of very restricted breeding, in a way. He was really handsome in the movies as well. So, like, for me, that's a whatever. Uh, he is an absolute professional in bed. 
I <laughs> let me let me repeat that. A man who, by all accounts, is still a virgin, technically. I I think that that first scene they had together, that breakdown scene, was his first time as well. Is an absolute professional in bed. He is professional. That that is. <laughs> No, <laughs> that is not. That is a fantasy. That is a fantasy, and that is where I'm like, the way that it's written, it, 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 especially, especially in those like sixty to seventy, especially when it's really, really fan fictiony. Um, he seems characterized as much older than her. The way that he is written would characterize him as a couple years older, despite the fact that they are the same age, which again falls into the fan fictiony kind of uh, <laughs> self insert roles, kind of like Twilight. I haven't even read Twilight, but I've seen the movies and how people talk about it. It's kind of like Twilight, you know, and mm, I would have been actually a little bit more interested in seeing, like, he can still be <laughs> good. That's not the problem. It's just the the proficiency, the, the air of experience that he has. It's like, no, I don't think that's how it would be. I th and if anything, I think it would be very kind of cute to see them discover that aspect together but we would need to jump out of the fan fiction and into an actual kind of realistic depiction which is not the purpose of this book but um it's still a critique i have <laughs> despite how much i love it <laughs> like don't get me wrong reading those scenes is like i love those scenes they're so good oh, they're so good but you know snap back to reality i don't think that's how it would be uh and, and also the, i am so interested i i don't know if anyone will even watch this far into the video especially a man but i'm so interested to see what a man thinks of this book i'm really interested for a man to read this book and have a genuine self-reflection on how they feel about draco's character because i think that draco's character in many many ways is a very unrealistic male character. <laughs> very idyllic. You know, he's a merciless killer and whatever. He's a very idyllic character. Let's be honest. Exactly what I said. We fall into the category of the magical pussy that saves him. And at some point I was... Like, at some point in the book I was like, this, this is starting to remind me of after. And that's not good. <laughs> that is really not good. <laughs> Anytime a book starts, like, kind of sounding and feeling like after or... Um, Fifty Shades of Grey, we're we're not in the good zone. <laughs> um, but yeah, final thoughts. Manacled was fun. Uh, I think it has a lot of flaws, but I think when it comes to overall, I am so glad I read it. The story is gripping, and it's it is a. F you can tell this is a more youthful way of writing. It's a more amateurish way of writing. Uh, it's very long. That's why I really wish there was an editor involved because you kind of stop trusting the author at times with what they're telling you. And it's a shame because a lot of the storytelling, a lot of the beats of the story are absolutely fantastic. It's so gripping to read some of these sequences and I'm. it was so interesting to me. I could not stop reading. I spent the week, pretty much any free time I had, I, I would read this book. But it was too long. <laughs> no, not too long. But it was it was very long and at times it fell apart. And, and then it came back together. And I did not like the epilogue. But overall, great story. Uh, it has reignited a passion in me for Harry Potter. And I think following this, I will be reading... Uh, not reading, sorry. I'll be watching all the Harry Potter movies. And I'll probably do a review of all of them, probably collectively. And... um. I will also play Hogwarts the game. I wasn't planning on playing the game, but it looks like fun. And this book has made me really want to engage with that world again. So well, those are my thoughts on Manacold. Go read it. If you actually sat through this video and you did not, you had not read it, I'm sorry that it was spoiled. But go read it anyways, because it's worth the read. I actually skipped so much of the story. I skipped like so much of the story. So... Thank you so much for thank you for so much for watching. 
and uh, this was a long one. It was unscripted, unlike last time, but I don't know what I prefer. Let me know if you have any preferences and if you're interested in other book reviews. I will do more for sure, <laughs> as long as I keep on reading. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye.